go on to uh, our next last panelist, which is Thomasita. And she will be speaking on some of the post strike litigation issues. Um, just on, on, a, on the club, Ruben Wilson, um, it should be noted that the reason he became a stockbroker was because he came back from serving in Vietnam that he had uh, so much uh, damage to his body from Agent Orange that um, you know, he, it was part of a program that we trained uh, because he had lost uh, vision and other, uh, he had other severe physical ailments. And so um, the, the, the Army had a program in which we trained veterans in, in uh, fields you know, where they could make a living since he had, he had lost the capacity in, for his previous um, Work and so that's how he came, how a brother from the strike ended up being a stockbroker. Um, and as far as the legal defense, I, first of all, I'd like to just set the stage that back in in, 1960, in the 1960s, the United States was engaged in a war uh, in Vietnam, and I remember um, myself in, in high school wondering like, why are we going over there and killing people who have not done anything to us if the the, um, the dollar bill has a motto uh, a motto on it that says, In God We Trust, and um, the seventh commandment is, Thou shalt not kill, so why are we killing people over there? That was just my high school thinking, you know. Um, and then the first week of school here, um, there were these uh, demonstrations that, you know, they used to round people up. Now, I want to sh sh share with you the, the, the draft. See, the, the government is very uh, slick now. With, you do now is that it's a voluntary army, but the people who are in it are people who have a very little economic opportunity. The people who grow up in places, you know, like Merced or places where there's nothing to do except go in the military to, to you know, because there's not, no other opportunities. So now there's another sneaky way to catch people and get them to join the military. Uh, but back then, um, there was a draft, and so there was a lottery. So it, your name could come up and then you would be drafted. And what they would do is they would take busloads of people over to the Oakland Induction Center and uh, shake their heads and do whatever they do when they induct people into the military. So, Joan Baez and uh, a bunch of pregnant women, my first week of college um, in 1966, um, they said that um, these women had been blocking the doors to the induction center in Oakland and they would bring the, the over there at four o'clock in the morning, these busloads of, of people being forced into the military, and um, so these ladies were blocking the um, entrance, thinking that you know pregnant women. How could the uh, police beat up pregnant women? But then the newspaper said that um, that, the, that the police were beating their bellies, and uh, so I had come out of Catholic school. I was you know a liberal, you know, just uh, trying to work, figure out what's going on in the world. But when I read that they actually had beaten uh, pregnant women in the door of the induction center, I went to see, you know, to see for myself. I couldn't believe it. You know, and so the next morning, I went over there at 4 o'clock in the morning with thousands of other people. And, um, and that's the day I got radicalized because it really was true. They, the police formed this huge formation and uh, came out as a, this, one, this one guy said, like I said, I was going out of Catholic school, so I said to this policeman that was right in front of me, because we were at a standoff, and um, I said, you know, brother, we could have been receiving communion at the last last Sunday together, and he just took his big stick, and he just started, um, he started, you know, putting it in front of my eyes, like threatening me, you know, not responding to my attempt at some sort of common humanity. But anyway, so uh, the reason I wanted to set the tone was um, because the, there was excitement in the air, the, it, the Right when the strike broke, there was um, the whole country, like there was resistance. People were getting messed over. They were, their, their family members were being drafted, being forced to go kill and be killed. And so the, it, we were just coming out of the, um, the 60s where a lot of people um, took psychedelics and had all their um, chakras blown open. And so um, realized how um, you know, that we are all hum human beings, um, just our common humanity, uh, because in the 50s people had, there was so much, like, during the Cold War, the culture was such that everybody just wore the same hairdo and wore the same clothes and didn't say hello to anybody. And then in the 60s, because of what happened here in San Francisco, 
how when they said free love but without meant you loved everybody in humanity without expecting something in return, you just loved all of humanity. That's what free love meant. But okay, so we were coming out of that, and so then there's, then in the late sixties, you know, on campus there was that that fear. And so what was key about the strike's success, because mind you, you know, you have we have a diverse place now, but that's probably a lot to do with the strike because when we first came on campus, um, there were no courses at all about the this, the viewpoint, the context of the people of color of this world. There were no courses in uh, the history of Latin America. There was one class on the history of Latin America that was taught by a retired oil executive who had been work, who had worked for um, Standard Oil in Brazil. That's the viewpoint. The corporate. Um, Western European uh, viewpoint that capitalism is good and that the invasion was good, that was the frame of reference for everything taught, just like it is in most schools everywhere to this day. But that's what it was here. There was that one class in history of Latin America and the same guy taught Spanish, and that was it. There was no other presses. You know, there were no Filipino uh, faculty telling the, the, the reality of what what is the Filipino reality the, what was the Chinese experience in, in, in relation to the Constitution, which is the class I took um, here. Um, the, so, so we had to fight because, for example, the only most of the students of color, the few that there were, were wealthy students from Africa or wealthy students from Latin America. But, the, but because of the tracking system, which was in existence at that time, which is that in grammar school, they, the public schools decided whether you were meant to go to college or if you were meant to be a car mechanic. And so then the students of color would get tracked um, into non-college preparatory classes. So if they decided they wanted to go to college, they wouldn't have been prepared because when they graduated from high school, they had been tracked to, to go into to a, a job that had to do with, um, like, uh, like I said, being a car mechanic instead of being able to go to college. So that was the tone, that was the feeling. So. The, the reason we won is because the, 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 the people on campus had uh, voted in a progressive slate and we had, had created some programs with the associated student money. Instead of going to the, faculty, to the sororities and the, the varsity, the, the funds that everybody paid $10 in to, you know, to be the associated students, those monies had gone to create certain programs such as draft help and uh, the experimental college and community services institute, which did community organizing. And uh, so those programs had already established a link into the communities because our mentality was all about we were at the university to develop our minds in service of our communities. So it was a strong link. So then when the strike was called, we already knew people all over the city. We had already served in the tutorial programs or in their communities, in our own respective communities. And so that's why we succeeded because it was community people and it was faculty and um, it was students. So. The, the strike, um, we, we had to form a legal defense committee when um, the, the first time that uh, the tactical squad which was created by the mayor to pick on us and they were given three foot long hardwood sticks and Nesbitt Crespio had just come out of the Quonset hut when the Black Student Union Central Committee was meeting and the tactical squad charged him and they hit him and he just landed on, on his, you know, on his, sprawled on the ground with his glasses broken and we all ran, but that night when we had our um, coordinating meeting, so they said, well, now when people are getting arrested, we have to have a legal defense committee. So I raised my hand because I had always wanted to be, to be a lawyer and I had dreamed of being the first woman Supreme Court Justice. And so I raised my hand and then um, the BSU uh, asked Roy Harrison to help me. And so we, we started the legal defense committee. A, a minister from one of the black churches in the Plymouth uh, Street offered his place for a, for a, for a center. And in the end, um, we ended up calling up every lawyer in the phone book because we needed to get lawyers for uh, 700 people who got arrested. But the last thing I want to share with you is that um, the day that 460 people got arrested in the, the mass arrest, because this is what had happened, uh, we had called for statewide show of support. So people came from as far as San Diego, Sacramento, Los Angeles, Fresno, to show support for the cause of a College of Ethnic Studies. And that's the day that Hayakawa ordered everybody surrounded and trapped and, and arrested on the basis of uh, illegal assembly, etc. So um, those 
so uh, my strategy was I had the idea to tell each of the defendants to um, ask, demand an independent trial because then they would cost the city so much money that they would never have a mass arrest again. And indeed, uh, that's what, so we used to have these defendants meetings every Friday night in the basement of Sacred Heart Church because by then we had moved to, to a bigger space. And so we made that announcement. We asked everybody uh, to, when they were arraigned the following week, to demand an independent trial. And so what ended up happening is that the 469 people were arrested, were tried in groups of 10. So that's 46 trials in group of groups of 10. We tied up all the courts room, all the court rooms in um, City Hall for two and a half years, and they never did another mass arrest until. The first Iraq invasion, that war, when all the kids with purple hair went up on the Bay Bridge and uh, stopped traffic on the Bay Bridge, and so they arrested all those kids, and the next day they were arraigned in front of Judge Ronald Kittiche, who had been a leader in the strike. <laughs> so, so, Dr. so Ronald Kittiche, of course, dismissed the, the case. So those are the only two. Uh, the, so that's the story on the mass arrests and on that strategy. and. Um, Congratulations to Rock Kennedy for um, all his years of service as a judge. He was appointed in the first incarnation of Jerry Brown when Jerry Brown was still progressive. Time to see it. <laughs> 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 <laughs>